All right. Thanks everyone for joining. And also, um, if you're watching this later, this um, the the point of this meeting is to be a how to get your offers accepted in the hot market, and hopefully it stands the test of time. So obviously there are form changes and things that may not be applicable um, down the line, but the majority of this, I suspect, will be um, will will pass the test of time. So we'll jump right in. Um, Oh, Robin, do you mind um, allowing me to share my screen? Yes, absolutely. I am sorry that I did not do that sooner. <laughs> That's fine. Um, so quick uh, disclosure up front. Obviously, everything I'm about to propose, well, most of what I'm about to propose it provide, uh, gives a little more risk to the buyer and a little more attractive to the seller. Right? That's obviously the goal of making your offer more attractive is to make the seller feel as comfortable as possible and make the buyer um, by, by eliminating outs for the buyer and, um, make and just making less contingencies for the buyer. So obviously anything I'm about to say, you do not have to do. Um, but these are all things that you can suggest to a buyer on how to get your offer accepted. Okay. So, um, I'm just going to jump right in. Obviously there's purchase price. Uh, yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna talk about the basics. We know there's purchase price. Make sure when you're putting the in included items in, you're only putting the included items that are um, included. Right? If there if there's a washer and dryer at the home but they're not included, don't check the washer and dryer. That's going to make your offer way less attractive. So really read the included items on the. Um, Oh, I haven't shared my screen yet. <laughs> really uh, review the included items on the uh, MLS and make sure you do that properly, okay? Um, purchase price is obvious. We, we don't need to talk about that. Let's talk about earnest money. I'm going to try and be brief and straight to the point. Earnest money, as you know, is very, very, very difficult to lose as a buyer, um, especially when you have contingencies. If you use a contingency to back out of a transaction, you get to keep your earnest money. So if you have an offer with an inspection contingency and all the other con uh, financing contingency and so, on, and so on, and your financing falls through, or you back out because you can't agree on something after the inspection, you get your earnest money back. So one thing I tell buyers is, hey, you're putting a $20,000 down payment on a home. Um, maybe consider doing a $15,000 earnest money. We're not going to lose your earnest money unless you like back out at the last second for no reason. Risk? Of course there's risk. You could back out. But if you're if you lose your job and you have a financing contingency, you still get your earnest money back. If you even do something ridiculous like accidentally not, not think about it and, and apply for a car loan and then you can't get the financing you thought, you get your earnest money back. So just remind your, your buyers, higher earnest money makes you look more attractive and it doesn't cost you a penny because it's credited to your down payment or, and or closing costs. So that's an easy, easy thing you can do to make your offer more attractive. Um, <coughs> um, you can click, click the box that says uh, a check or you can do um, a click this other box and say why or whatever the case. And then you want to- click I actually on can't see your screen, my dear. It's all shrinking down again. Oh, I there you go. Is that, is that it? You Much better. Me? Much better. Okay, perfect. This is a new forms, by the way. Um, so um, you always want to check either check or other and other would be a wire and closing agent is the escrow officer who's going to hold it. And then this is very, very important. Number eight, check one forfeiture of earnest money or seller election of remedies. That's saying if the buyer fails to close, what's going to happen? You always want to check forfeiture of earnest money. Seller's election of remedies means they can go after your earnest money and sue the buyer. Always, always, always. I can't think of any exception. Check the forfeiture of earnest money. Another really simple one um, to just easy. Don't counter on the title and escrow company. Ask the, if it's not in the agent remarks, ask the agent, send them a text or an email and, and say, what title company do you want? What escrow office do you want? Tell your buyer, do not negotiate on that. Go with what they want to go with because you don't want to separate yourself for some petty thing like that. Um, closing date, obviously the quicker the close, the better. Let's talk about possession date. Possession date, generally you do on closing. You can also do other and say plus three days or if the closing date is March 24th, you can say March 27th is the possession date. This is obviously a risk, but this is saying, hey, we're going to close on the 24th. Your seller is going to get their money and then they have to be out by the 27th. So you have three days. You don't have to pay us or anything. Um, and, and you have to be out by 9 p.m. on 
that third day or whatever the case. It can be seven days, it can be 14 days. Just know that is a risk because what's happening when you allow a seller to live there after your buyer has purchased a home? The seller is quite literally the tenant of the buyer. If the seller were to, this is crazy to even think about, but what if the seller doesn't move out then? You'd literally have to evict them. I've never seen that happen. I've heard of it happening. I've never seen it happen. That seems crazy that that might happen, but that's so, so attractive, especially if it's an owner occupied home and the owner, you know, is an elderly couple or whatever, and they would love an extra few days to move out and not have to stress about getting out the day of closing. Okay. Isaac. Uh, yes. So Devin and I were talking about the liability that comes with rent backs and what have you. And we were talking about the liability of, you know, let's say it is a couple that's living in the home and someone slips and falls in the shower well, they're your tenant and you're the owner. Yep. Let's talk about that. You have to get, you have to tell your insurance about this. Tell them that this is going to happen. Um, and um, they will add a clause. It will not cost them much money. It'll only be a few days of the extra money. Let's say it's a hundred dollars extra a month, which is absurd. It will not be a um, hundred dollars divided by, um, divided by, it's not that. I'm actually, let, sorry, let's be way more reasonable. Let's say $50 divided by 30 days and they need, and they're saying they're an extra week times seven, that is 1166 total for the extra insurance. So yes, yes, yes. Talk to your insurance. If you're the buyer, talk to the insurance, your insurance company, and make sure that they, um, that they add a clause in there that says if something were to happen, since you're not living there, blah, blah, blah. I'm not an insurance agent, but definitely talk to them. If it is longer than a few days, you want to use a form 65B, which I won't get into today, but it's a delayed occupancy agreement. It's like a rental agreement a seller that says um, they're allowed to occupy the property for a few days, but it also has like a uh, lease jargon so that, um, so, so it protects your buyer a little more. It's a few days. I normally don't do that. I'm not advising you to do one way or another. I'm just saying that's another option that you can do. I also talked to Devin today about, you can also put in that um, in the other box at the bottom of the form 65, you could say something like, $1,000 security deposit to be held by, to be credited to the buyer upon closing and to be refunded to the seller upon move, move out and leaving the home in good condition. Again, I'm not an attorney. Let's talk through this if you need help with this, but those are options that can be very attractive to an owner-occupied home, um, an owner-occupied seller. Um, obviously, the quicker you can close, the better. Talk to your lender and say, what is the absolute quickest we can close? Almost always the seller wants a quick closing date, especially if you're doing a quick closing date and delayed occupancy. Wow, that is so much more attractive. Um, literally think about taxes. If taxes on a property are $6,000 for the year divided by 365 days in a year, that means it's costing them in taxes $16.50 a day for every day that it doesn't close. Um, also, if they have a mortgage, they're paying interest every single day, which it normally ends up being closer to 30, 40 bucks a day. So it ends up, this is costing, um, this is costing a seller nearly $50 a day. I'm using super generic numbers um, to not close. So the quicker you can close, you're literally saving them money. Um, I always have the seller, uh, I, I always check this box that they, the seller's going to include 22K and that the seller is going to make sure all charges and assessments are paid by closing. It's just too risky to not to not click those boxes because what if there's a, ma a major utility bill? That could be, it could be, I mean, huge. So don't, I wouldn't negotiate on these terms. Okay. That's it on the form 21. Let's talk about some addendas you can use. Um, this is not an addendum, but this is something to consider. When you get um, when you get a form 17, generally it's included in supplements and you scroll to the bottom, the buyer acknowledges receiving the form 17. Line three is only applicable if, um, if it's like a probate deal um, where the, uh, there's, there's a couple other examples, uh, a bank owned. Um, I think there's a couple more, but there are some deals where the buy, the seller is exempt from providing the form 17. So line three is only applicable for that. Line one is a safe thing to do for your buyer because it says the buyer has three days. I'm totally going quick here, but it essentially says the buyer has three days to review the form 17 after they receive it and back out if they don't like something they found there. My point to my buyers, I almost every single time check box two because my point to my buyers is, um, is review the form 17 before you sign the form 17. If you're good with everything on the form 17, you don't need three days to review the form 17. So just do number two, which just says 
we've got the form 17, we reviewed it, we're good. We can't back out with the form 17. If I'm representing the seller, that's very important to me. That's that's like an extra inspection response almost. Not really, it's not really an inspection response, but it's an out for the buyer. And that's just tying up a loose end. So that's really important. Sorry, I'm gonna back go back to the form 21. I have one more thing to show you. The MLS, full disclosure, will tell you, do not cross out parts of, um, parts of a transaction. Um, you're not a lawyer. You shouldn't do that. I'm not saying that you should do it. We should talk, you should talk to an attorney or talk to myself before, um, before you make that decision. But I see a lot of people in this hot market cross out section W section W says that's whoa, they changed it. Sorry. It's section X. Now it used to be section W. Sorry. I got, this is the new form that just came out literally today, March 3rd, 2021. So bear with me there, but buyers shall have 10 days after mutual acceptance to verify all information provided from seller or listing broker related to the property. This contingency shall be deemed satisfied, satisfied unless the buyer gives notice after 10 days or before 10 days. That's literally saying you have a get out of jail free card um, within 10 days of mutual acceptance. Um, if you find anything in the, um, in the listing that, um, that was inaccurate, which happens all the time, right? We're, we're imperfect. And sometimes we get information from a seller and, and it's not true. Um, I saw someone get out of a transaction because they said the seller, the uh, listing broker listed a home and said in utilities on the listing that there was gas connected. There wasn't gas connected. It was obvious that it wasn't connected, but because that was in the MLS and this section wasn't crossed out, the person got out and got to keep the earnest money on formality. This is an for, this is a section that you can cross out, have your buyer's initial, and that makes your offer that much more attractive. Because again, it's just like the Form 17, right? It's saying, I don't have this as a get out of jail free card. Okay, let's talk about the 22A. And this is the new 22A form. Um, it doesn't look different to me because, okay. I'll just jump right in. So there's um, a few things you can do. First off, section one, you have this timeline here. This timeline here is saying that you will provide within five days, if not filled in after mutual acceptance, um, a pre-approval letter for the specific property address for the specific purchase of price. Purchase a price, <laughs> purchase price. If you are including that into your um, into your offer, you're including a pre-approval letter for the specific address for the specific purchase price with your offer. This can be zero days. If you're going to for sure have it to them by tomorrow, this can be one day. So shorten that timeline. Shorter timelines is just more attractive to the seller. I'm really confused right now because yesterday we had a meeting about um, about um, them taking out this portion. So I, I, I may have to re-educate myself. Just in general, shorten timelines as much as possible. This timeline here is saying the seller can ask for an update on the loan at any time, 10 days, if not filled in. Um, why not make that three days or five days, right? It doesn't make sense. Have it a short time. It doesn't hurt your seller. It's your buyer. It's just saying at three days or five days, the seller can ask for an update. And then the buyer has three days right here to give an update through the lender. Section three, and again, I'm a little confused because I thought that portion of the form was changing. So these type of things can change. So if this isn't, if these aren't options in the future when you're watching this video, that's fine. Just ignore that. Um, the seller's right to terminate. This is another one. It's if left blank, it's 30 days. Um, but what this is, is this is saying that the seller at 30 days or less, if you shorten the timeline, can ask your buyer to waive their financing contingency. This is really important. If the buyer the buyer does not have to say yes, they can say no. Number one, if the buyer says no, the seller can back out. But let's think like a seller for a second. If I tell the buyer, if I send this form and say, hey, buyer, waive your financing, and the buyer says, no, we still want the home, but we're not waiving our financing, that seems very unlikely that a seller is going to still say, well, oh, we're going to terminate. No, they still want to work with the buyer, but it's kind of like that's another reason why this is just something that you can throw in that um, doesn't. Um, that, that makes your offer look that much more attractive, but it's likely not gonna have an effect on your buyer. If you do do this, really consider saying, will not in section 3C, because that's saying if the buyer wa waives the financing contingency, it will not also waive the appraisal, okay? You can check will, 
But that means if you waive your financing contingency at any point, you are also waiving the appraisal, which is way more scary than just waiving your financing contingency. All that it means to waive your financing contingency, if you check will not, is that if your financing falls through, i.e. you lose your job or something like that, or you do something dumb with your credit and you can't get your loan anymore, then you lose your earnest money. So if you're smart as a buyer, that's not going to happen or it's possible you could lose your job, which would be horrible, but unlikely as well, right? So just be very careful how you coach your buyers. But I tell them like, how confident are you in keeping your job? And they're like, uh, totally confident. I'm not losing my job. Then just check the will, uh, check the will not and shorten this timeline. And again, sellers will likely not even send this 22 AR. It's just kind of like, it looks more attractive, but maybe one out of 10 sellers actually, listing brokers actually utilize this. I'm, I'm gonna be really quick on this. Loan cost provisions. If your buyer does not need loan costs paid by the seller, don't ask for it. It's not as simple as, uh, you know, we could use an extra $5,000 cash. Um, so let's have the seller pay $5,000 of our loan costs, and then we'll increase our offer by 5,000. It's not that simple of math. Cause if I'm offering 400,000, no seller paid closing costs, and you're offering 405,000, but the seller pays 5,000 closing costs. I, as a seller am going to pay a little higher in excise tax, a little higher title and escrow fees, a little higher commission and so on. So it's like, if you're, it's not really apples to apples. Okay. I'm not going to belabor that. That one's pretty obvious. But just tell your buyers, if you don't need this, don't ask for it because it's very much, it's very much less attractive. <laughs> that sounds so dumb. Um, okay, let's keep going on to the 22 AD. I don't see the 22 AD as a new form here. Okay, well, I'm going to get back to the 22 AD then. Um, I'll open that up at the end of the meeting. Um, okay, let's talk about the 35. We just have three more forms to go through and then we'll be done here. 35, if you are going to use an inspection, I'm not telling you to waive an inspection or whatever, but if you are going to have an inspection and you check box one, by the way, this is saying you can also check, you can also do a sewer inspection or you cannot do a sewer inspection, but it's default says may if you don't check either box. Keep your timelines short. Most, you know, most, there's a lot of people waiving inspections, but if I'm representing the seller and I see a 10 day inspection timeline, I'm like, hell no. Are you kidding me? It should be, in, it should be three, four, five days. Um, I would love to see it at three, three days personally, because you should be able to have an inspector out there within three days and, ha and be able to give me a response within three days. But at least don't go any less than any more than seven days. I really, really encourage you to do that. It looks so much more attractive to have three here instead of seven. And if you call your inspector when you write the offer, I've done this so many times and I say, hey man, it's Saturday. Can you do an inspection on Monday on this property? He says, yes. I put one day here or two days here. And then I tell the seller when I send the offer, I say, we have our inspection scheduled for 9 a.m. on Monday and we'll have an inspection response to you Monday night or Tuesday night or Tuesday morning, whatever the case. Um, here's the reason why I always shorten this to three days. I mean, almost always you have this out right here. This says, if you do the inspection and the inspector says, hey, you should get another, you should have another expert review the roof because I'm not a roofer, which happens almost every time or you know, the water heater or the furnace or something like that. All you have to do is send that recommendation from the inspector with the 35R. Um, um, I'll just show you really quick. So you send um, a PDF with a uh, written um, uh, advi advisement from the inspector saying, hey, roof looks old. I suggest getting a, a roofing contractor to give you a second opinion on it. You send that as a PDF and you open up the 35R and you check this box right here, additional buyer gives notice of additional inspection. You do not need the seller's permission. You are just saying we are taking an additional X amount of days because we need, because we found more than we were expecting. That's such an easy loophole. It's totally legal and ethical to use this. Um, and I use it maybe every third transaction, Man, eh, probably more like every fourth. It happens all the time. Um, I do also shorten this to like three days. So it's three days and three days, but three days and three days is really nine days. Did I do that right? 
three days and three days is really no, 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 no. Sorry. Three days and three days is really seven days, right? Because it, you don't include, no, eight days. Final answer. It's really eight days because you don't include weekends and holidays. So if you've got mutual acceptance on a Monday, you got Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then you get an extra three days. You got Friday, skip Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday is when it's due. Does that make sense? So if you need to, you're really getting a total of eight days if you have three and three. Okay. These timelines I leave at the default. Seller has three days to respond. Buyers has three days to respond. Seller has three days to make the repairs. I don't shorten those timelines because you want extra time on those. Um, escalation, there's not too much to talk about this. I'm gonna open it really quick so you guys can all see it. Um, Escalation clauses, I absolutely love them because it's like playing poker with your cards on the table. You're saying, hey, I'm offering you 400 on the Form 21, but we'll go up to 450 if we have to, but you have to show us the other offer in order to get us that high. So your buyer will only spend their max if they have to spend their max. A couple notes. Number one, do not put a number here that your buyer is not absolutely happy paying. Not stoked, but at least they're fine with it. If this number is 450, tell them there is a really good chance that it will be 450. So you're sure you're okay with 450, right? Don't say it probably won't go that high. No, if you're putting 450 here and the offer will not exceed, make sure they are very comfortable. And of course, make sure they're approved to that amount. Number two. Isaac? Yes. So, well, let's say someone puts an offer in at 440. Like do you have to only escalate that extra 10,000 because of this form? Like, or when they show you the other offers, what determines how much yep. you pay? So let's talk about it. So there's two blanks here that are important. Number one is how much you will beat the next highest offer by. Okay. Let's say it's $2,500. And let's say this is, this is, we will not go higher than 450 though. Okay. So there's an offer that comes in at 440. So what that does is it automatically makes your offer go to 442, 500. Really important that you explain this properly. Automatically goes to 40, 442, 500. It's not they counter you at 442, 500. It automatically is. That's why this number is so important that they do feel comfortable because it's not like, hey, we're, we're countering you at 442, 500. Can you sign off on this? No, you're already saying we will go up to 450, period. No second questions. Also, another question, what if your offer is 450 here, but you're like a high down conventional and another offer comes in at 460? Um, they can still accept your offer, but the other offer at 460 is like a VA offer and they're asking for 10,000 seller paid closing costs. So they want to go with your offer. That still pushes your offer up to 450. Does that make sense? Even though you won't go above 450, it still pushes you to your max because they got an offer above yours. This is probably obvious, but just so you know, it is less credits, right? So if there's an offer at 455, but they're asking for 10,000 seller paid closing costs, th that other offer is really 445 net to the seller. And thus they would only increase your offer by 2,500 from the 445. This is really deep stuff. If you have questions about this, um, we could take a deeper dive. Um, escalations, you have to be really, really careful. So do ask me. But the one thing I wanted to say about the escalation that's really important, don't trip over a penny to get to a dime. Don't make this number a thousand dollars. Oh my gosh. Especially if you're VA or FHA, nobody wants a VA or FHA offer. I'm not saying that's right, but it's true. Most people do not want to work with a VA or FHA buyer. Um, and we could talk a whole other meeting about why that's the case or what, if it's justified, but that's the case. So if you're a VA or FHA buyer, absolutely do not have a thousand dollars here because I would rather take a conventional offer and make a thousand dollars less than take an FHA offer and get a thousand dollars more. I know that may sound crazy. Again, we could talk for hours about why that might be the case, but don't be greedy on this. And I tell my buyers like, come on, do you really want to lose this offer over 3000? Well, no. Do you want to lose over 4000? No. Would you want to lose over 5000? Eh, probably. Okay, perfect. So 4000 or 4500 is our number. And this is huge because it's saying we will beat the next highest offer by 40 up to 4500, by the way, because again, going back to our original number, if somebody offered 447 and our escalation went up to 450, we're not going to go up to 451, 500. We're just going up to our max 450. But if the other offer is 440, this would push our offer up to 440, 440, 4, 500. I'm using a lot of random numbers, which makes this kind of confusing. Um, but do talk to me if you have questions about this. Um, just 
the moral of the story, don't put a number here unless your buyer is absolutely approved and happy to go to that number. And don't be greedy on this number. Try and get this number as high as your buyer feels comfortable because if they wouldn't want to lose a home over $5,000, then make this number $5,000 and it makes your offer that much more attractive because if every other escalation has a 2,000 here, you're that much better. And I have one more form to go over. Okay. Sorry guys, this form is new. So I, I um, th this is the first time I've actually seen this brand new form because it just came out today. I'm just going to explain this um, really quick. The form 22 AD is an amazing form that says, if the appraisal comes in low, my buyer will pay extra down payment to cover the low appraisal. Translation, we offer 400, we're mutual acceptance at 400, okay? And we have a 22 AD that says we'll pay up to 20,000 above the appraised value if we have to. Okay, the appraisal comes in at 390. That means that your buyer who's putting 5% down, he's already putting 20,000 down. Now he has to put in 20,000 plus 10,000 to cover the difference. So now they're putting 30,000 down and the seller still nets the same. Essentially what the 22 AD is doing, if it's a high enough 22 AD, it's just about as good as cash because you're saying, I'm going to pay above the appraised value. And that is the main concern a seller has when they accept a finance offer versus a cash offer is they're nervous about the appraisal coming in low and the seller drop it, having to drop the purchase price in order to sell. This is complicated stuff again. So don't, no shame if you, if you need me to explain that in greater detail, just um, do schedule a meeting with me and let's talk about it. But if your buyer has the money to pay additional if they have to, again, the appraisal could still come in at 400 and you don't have to pay any extra, it's just good. But if but if they have the money and they and they would still be happy putting 30,000 down instead of the 5%, 20,000 down, it's a no brainer because it's so attractive to the seller. And I'm going to say one last thing about this. First, talk to your lender before you do this. Generally, if you have a buyer who's putting 10% down, the difference between an interest rate and PMI, private mortgage insurance, on 10% down versus 5% down is very little. Again, talk to a lender. Don't take my word for that, but it's very little. We're talking a few, a few bucks a month. So maybe talk to your buyer about talking to their lender about saying, okay, what if we were to offer 5% down, but have the other 5% that we can throw at the 22 AD? So again, using our real numbers here, $400,000 home, we're going to put 10000 10% down, that's 40,000. Let's instead say we're putting 5% down. And now we have another $20,000 that we can use if we have to. And then that $20,000 will only come in if the appraisal comes in low. And if the appraisal doesn't come in low, you can still pay 10% down or 5% down. They have the flexibility, but the seller's stoked because they got a 5% down conventional, which they don't care 5%, 10%, like that's splitting hair. Sure, maybe 10% is better, but if you have a 22 AD, so, so attractive. So I'm talking to myself in circles, but the point is talk to a lender, especially if you have someone around that 10, 15, 12, 8% down mark, it's a random number. It's not giving you much of a cheaper payment. Talk to your lender and your buyer about getting your down payment to what you need, which is normally on a conventional loan, 5%, and then having the extra money as flexibility to throw at a low appraisal. And oh my gosh, that will, I guarantee you, you'll get 50% more of your offers accepted. Seriously, guaranteed. It's like 22 ADs are the best thing, the best thing you can take away from this meeting today. Um, I'm going to look at, right before I wrap this up, I want to look at one email that I sent um, to Robin the other day on ways that you can make your offer more attractive. No, that's everything. I covered everything. <laughs> um, um, I thought maybe I had, I had no, another tip. In summary, earnest money as high as they can. Um, waive the section X on the form 21. Waive the form 17 shorten all the timelines as much as you possibly claim, possibly can, and then try to use a 22 AD if possible. Um, as little seller paid closing costs as possible, little things like that. If you can, if a buyer is fine waiving an inspection, that obviously is huge. There's so many little things, but um, 
yeah, if though, I hope that was, I hope that was helpful. And again, I hope that's kind of timeless. So if you're watching this at a later time, that can probably help you in any hot market, or even if it's not a hot, hot market and you're competing with other people, those are just some easy ways to make your offer so much more attractive. Awesome. Thank you. Of course. Thanks everybody. Um, have a great day. And as always, these can be very complicated. So feel free to call me if you have any questions.